And our speaker today is Christian Bibby from Louisiana State University, who will tell us about parameterized topological complexity of arrangement bundles. Take it away. Thank you so much to the organizers for the invitation. Um, so let me share this screen. So this is joint work with Dan Cohen, uh, who was just speaking. So I'm going to, for a brief outline of what I'll be talking about, I'm going to recall the definition of topological complexity, which probably everyone here knows, but I want to ease into this parameterized version, which is probably less well known, um, before getting to the context that we're actually working with, which is uh, bundles of hyperplane arrangements. Okay, so, um, if we're given a space of, of possible configurations, a, a motion planning algorithm is an algorithm which takes in two possible configurations and produces a continuous path between them. So one way to think about this is, is a section of this vibration taking, uh, going from continuous paths from the interval to x to the product x times x. Um, so a section of this uh, takes in two points and then produces this continuous path from one to the other. So in an ideal world, this section would be continuous, but that turns out to only be the case when, when X is contractible. So we wanna do this kind of as continuously as possible. And so that's what this topological complexity measures. And so here, what we wanna do is cover X times X with the smallest number of open sets so that on each open, we do get a continuous section of this bundle. All right, and the kind of formal definition of this topological complexity is the sectional category of this, of this vibration. So one of the first examples of this is, is trying to, to um, do motion planning between configurations of points on a plane when they're not allowed to collide. So the space of configurations is given by taking, say, n tuples of points in the plane. By the plane, I'm thinking of the complex numbers where no two points are the same. So I want to go from kind of one configuration of n distinct points to another configuration of n distinct points in a continuous path. So that it was determined that the, the topological complexity of this is, is 2n minus 2. So we can change the question a little bit. Um, maybe they, they can't roam all over the plane, but there's, say, m obstacles that we have to avoid. So you could look at configurations of n distinct points that are trying to avoid m distinct obstacles in the plane. But to make this question a little more interesting, maybe we don't actually know the positions of these m obstacles that we're trying to avoid. So here, you know, if we knew the positions of these M obstacles, we're really looking for configurations of N points in the plane, except for at those, those M positions of the obstacles. But if we let these obstacles vary positions, um, the possible positions of, of those M obstacles is given by this, this configuration space. So configurations of M distinct points in the plane. So kind of all possible configurations, so all possible choices of where these M obstacles to avoid are, and then also these, these N, N points that we're, we're arranging in the plane that avoids these obstacles are all wrapped up into this big total space of configurations of N plus M points. And we can really wrap this, this question up into really just looking at this, this fiber bundle given by Fidel and Neuwirth, that if we have n plus m distinct points in the plane, we can forget the last n of them. And this gives me m distinct points and the fiber of over one of these, these points. So if I pick one possible position for these m obstacles to avoid, the fiber is all of the ways to arrange these, these n, n points avoiding those m obstacles. So we want a version of this motion planning that, that, that deals with this kind of unknown position of these M, M obstacles. So this is where this parameterized topological complexity comes in. So here we're starting with a fiber bundle with a fiber X 
And we think about the space space as parametrizing some sort of external conditions on our system. So if we fix some point in our base space, the fiber is telling me, here's all of these achievable configurations that satisfy these external constraints imposed by that, that point B. So we're really trying to do some, some kind of motion planning in each of these fibers, but we don't really know which fiber we're sitting in. So this, um, so in the usual um, motion planning, we're looking at paths from say, I to E and, and the vibration that, that picks out kind of the initial and, and terminal states and taking a section of that. So here, if we want to make sure that th this path satisfies these same external constraints, what we, want and what we want is for this path to every point in this path to satisfy the same external constraints. So if we look at a continuous path from the interval to to this space E, we want to know that when we project down to B, it turns out to be constant. So that's saying this path lies in one fiber of this fiber bundle. And then we can map this over to not just the product E times E, but this fibered product. So pairs that um, pairs of points in E that agree when we project down to, to B. So taking one of these continuous paths and peeling off the initial and terminal configurations gives us an element of this fiber product. So now a section of this map is going to be a motion planning algorithm. So it'll take in not just initial and terminal configurations, but it'll make sure that those initial and terminal con configurations are satisfy the same external conditions. So they're lying in the same fiber. And what it'll do is it'll produce a continuous path that lies completely in that same fiber. So this parameterized topological complexity is then going to look at kind of the, as close to um, measuring kind of how, how close to continuous we can get with this section. So we want to cover this, this fibered product with the smallest number of open sets so that on each open, this, this section is continuous. Um, so it's a sectional category of this vibration. So I'm, I'm going to denote it by this this throughout the talk, so the topological complexity of this fiber bundle. Um, but kind of some alternative notation reflecting the fact that we're really trying to do this kind of motion planning in the fiber, but where we have this kind of extra thing to worry about coming parameterized from the base space B. Okay. So one useful property that we're going to need is that if I have a fiber bundle and I pull it back through some map to another fiber bundle, then this can't increase the, the complexity. So the topological complexity of this fiber bundle is at most the topological complexity of this fiber bundle. So we're going to use this, this property later. But one special case of this gives us um, something that should, should satisfy our intuition here. If we pull back our bundle to a single point, so a fiber sitting over that single point, uh, when you pull this back, it tells us that the topological complexity of this is less than or equal to the topological complexity of this. But here, this topological complexity of this, because our base space is just a single point, there's not anything to parameterize. So this is just the ordinary topological complexity of that fiber X. So what this is telling us is this parameterized version is at least uh, the topological complexity of X. So by adding in these kind of unknown obstacles or external constraints parameterized by this space B might increase the topological complexity but it can't decrease the complexity. And in some cases, this we do get, actually get an equality here, in particular if the bundle is trivial. Um, so if these parameter, if this parameterization doesn't do anything interesting, then the topological complexity is just the topological complexity of the fiber. So as a first example, of computing this, we saw this fidel neuwirth vibration for these configuration spaces. So this is that problem I posed earlier. We want to look at how to um, 
move from a configuration of n distinct points in the plane to another configuration of n distinct points in the plane while avoiding m obstacles where we don't really know their positions, but they're parameterized by this, this space here. So this answers that question that I posed before of doing this collision-free motion planning in the, in the plane with m obstacles that we have to avoid in unknown positions. So the context that we're going to compute this parameterized topological complexity is with hyperplane arrangements. So here by a hyperplane arrangement, I mean a finite set of hyperplanes inside of some complex vector space V. And a hyperplane, I mean a linear subspace of codimension one, complex codimension one. So given some set of hyperplanes, so the the topological space that we care about, so this is modeling really our, our space of configurations, is going to be the vector space minus the union of all of these hyperplanes. And what makes these, these, these arrangements special is that it has this nice underlying combinatorial structure described by what, by what we call the intersection lattice. So this is looking at all possible intersections of hyperplanes taken from A. So each of these is, is a linear subspace of this vector space. And so we can partially order them by reverse inclusion. Um, so this, this set of intersections has the structure of a partially ordered set or a post set, uh, more specifically a geometric lattice. So I'm not gonna go into the details of what this, this structure is, but um, this is the lattice of flats of, of some matroid. And there's one terminology that I'm going to throw around a lot. So associated to a matroid is this notion of rank. Um, so for us, what this means is if I have some set of hyperplanes in my arrangement, I'm going to define its rank as the codimension of, of the intersection. So the complex codimension of this subspace inside of my big vector space V. So the motivating examples for us are variations of this classical configuration space that I mentioned before. So here, if I look at a hyperplane inside of C to the N, where the ith and jth coordinates of a point are, are equal. So this is really a diagonal of this vector space. If I look at all possible diagonals, this gives me some arrangement of, of hyperplanes in, in C to the N. And so it's complement, so all of the points that do not lie on one of these hyperplanes are exactly all of the points in C to the N where no two uh, coordinates are equal. So this is precisely that configuration space that I had mentioned earlier. Okay, so we can realize this, this example that I gave as, as the complement to some arrangement, which I would call the braid arrangement. And here the combinatorial structure, so if I look at all of these intersections, um, kind of abstracting this to the to the common show side, you can think of an intersection as really a partition of the set one through n. The idea being that if I intersect some of these these diagonals, um, so a point on that intersection is going to lie inside of this diagonal whenever x i equals x j. So this corresponds to an equivalence relation on the indices where I declare i and j to be equivalent. So I have a kind of a picture of a simple case over here. So when n is equal to three, this is really an arrangement inside of C3, but I can't draw C3. So what I want you to imagine is that these are three complex planes that all intersect at a complex line. And this, this picture is describing this partially ordered set of all of these intersections where we have, if we don't intersect any of these diagonals, we get the ambient space. So that's what this, this thing at the bottom is reflecting is the, the C3. I don't have any coordinates equal because one, two, and three are all in different blocks of my partition. Whereas here, one and two are in the same block of the partition and three is separate. So this is saying X1 is equal to X2. So that's my hyperplane H12. Um, and this is my H13 and this is my H23. And then if I intersected any two or all three of them, then I'm really declaring that all three coordinates should be equal. And so that's what gives me this, this line in the center here where those three intersected at a line. Okay. 
So some variations on this, and if the next natural step is to look at what's called graphic arrangements. So here, if I take a simple graph that I'll call gamma on the vertex set one through N, I can think of its set of edges as really pairs of, of into pairs of elements from one through N. So for every edge, I can take that particular diagonal hyperplane, and I'm gonna call this A sub gamma. So in particular, if, a, if every single pair has an edge, so if I have the complete graph, then I'm taking all of the diagonals and that's really this braid arrangement I was just talking about. So example one is really a special case of example two here. But in general, in the complement, I mean, if, I, if the graph is missing some particular edge, say the edge between one and two, then in the complement, I'm allowed to have x1 equals x2. So I can think of this as a partial configuration space where I'm allowing some of the points in the plane to collide, but the, the collisions are kind of dictated by what edges are missing from this graph. And another interesting example encompassed by this is, is what I'll call the type BC arrangement. So here we take all of these di diagonal hyperplanes, but we also take these kind of off diagonals where Xi is the negative of Xj. And we also take coordinate hyperplanes, so where I declare one of the coordinates to be equal to zero. So the collection of all of these things I'll denote by a B sub n. I have a special case drawn over here when n is equal to two. I have this diagonal and it's off diagonal and then my coordinate hyperplanes. Of course, I'm drawing it in R2, but I mean in C2. And then this, this picture is reflecting how they intersect, that I have kind of the, the whole space and I have four hyperplanes and those four things intersect at a single point. So it's, it's complement is an example of what's called an orbit configuration space. So this kind of alternatively arises from an action of the group Z mod two on C star. But really the, the name, the type BC arrangement, the name is coming from the fact that these, these hyperplanes are the reflecting hyperplanes for the type BC vial group. Okay, but this orbit configuration spaces are kind of another generalization of this, this classical configuration space. So these, I mean, the advantage of working with arrangements is that we can encompass kind of all of these configuration-like spaces in one, in one framework. So we're specifically interested in bundles of arrangements. So kind of like with configuration spaces, we cared about this Fidel Neuwirth bundle, configurations of n plus m points to m points. So when do we get bundles for, for arrangement complements? So I have to introduce some kind of technical definitions. So if I'm looking, so this L of A, remember this is looking at intersections of hyperplanes in A. And if I have two, two possible intersections where one contains the other, I'm gonna denote this. So this is some interval of my poset. So this is a collection of all of the intersections that lie between them that lie between X and Y. And so in, inside of this, in this interval, so this is, um, if I look at some element in here, so this is some Z that is sitting in between X and Y. I, I say that it's modular if whenever I take some other W, so some other subspace in this set, the sum is also an element of that set. So here, remember these are all, these Z, W, X, Y, these are all subspaces of some big vector space V. So by Z plus W, I mean that, that subspace of V. So if this is always contained inside of this set, if I can actually realize it as some intersection of hyperplanes from A, uh, then I say that this Z is a modular element. And it's this, this condition is what's giving us our, our bundles for arrangement complements. So just a little more notation, if I have some intersection, I can look at the set of all of the hyperplanes that contain that. 
Um, so I'm going to denote this by an a sub y. So each of these is a hyperplane inside of this vector space V. And if my hyperplane contains y, so both the hyperplane and y are subspaces of my vector space V, so I can quotient by, by y. Whenever my hyperplane contains y, I can quotient by it. So this is going to be some hyperplane inside of V mod y. All right, so the 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 bundle really comes from this this quotient by some modular element. So whenever I have this modular element, then this is giving me a fiber bundle from from the arrangement complement M of A to the complement of this this A sub Y inside of V mod Y. The fiber is also of note because it is also an, a, a complement of an arrangement. Um, but here in the fiber, the, the hyperplanes are not necessarily linear subspaces. They might not pass to the origin. So it's really a complement to some arrangement of affine hyperplanes inside of a vector space. So this, the example where we had our ordinary configuration spaces, so what I called the braid arrangement, looking at all of these diagonals. And here I'm specifically going to look and see n plus m. So taking all of these possible diagonals, it turns out that if I intersect those diagonals where the coordinates are just taken from the, the first m coordinates, this is some modular element in here. And this is going to recover really the, the fidel neuwirth bundle on my configuration spaces. So the complement of this is exactly this. And so this, this is the fidel neuwirth bundle that I had mentioned earlier. And here the fiber is this configuration of endpoints in this punctured plane. I can think of this as sitting inside of C to the N, where instead of puncturing the plane, I can remove some affine hyperplanes from my C to the N. So I can realize this kind of, as I said above, the complement of some affine hyperplanes in, in CN. So the other thing that this, these modular elements give us is that sometimes our, our fiber bundle breaks into breaks up into some smaller fiber bundles. So if we actually have, so going between X and Y, if we have module, a chain of modular elements, or kind of we increase dimension by one in each step. So if we have a bunch of modular elements sitting in here, we can kind of successfully quotient by them. And each step along the way is going to be a fiber bundle. So we call this, this the super solvable. Um, and what this topologically gives us is a tower of fiber bundles. And here, because, because the dimension only changes by one each time, the fiber is some affine arrangement inside of C, or really it's just a punctured plane. All right, and the examples that, that I gave earlier are, are super solvable. Notably, the braid arrangement is super solvable. So I already kind of talked about these intersections as being modular. And so going kind of one step at a time, if we have a configuration of endpoints and we forget the last point, that will give us a configuration of n minus one points. So this is one special case of this fidel neuwirth bundle. The fiber over some configuration of n minus one points here is all of the ways that I can add this nth point that's distinct from them. So the fiber is C minus the N minus one points that I, I have to avoid here. But this is, this is kind of breaking down these cell new bundles into kind of one, dropping one point at a time. It's this, this composition of, of fiber bundles. For these graphic arrangements, so these have complements that are partial configuration spaces where I allow some collisions. They're not always super solvable, but we can understand pretty well when they are, and that's when the graph is chordal. Um, and what this roughly means is that in any time I have a cycle in my graph with more than three edges, it should have some chord connecting to two vertices in the in the cycle. So whenever I have this, another kind of way to loosely think about this is the graph is built out of triangles. So the, the complete graph giving us our braid arrangement is, is, is chordal, but um, in general, whenever we have a chordal graph, we're going to get this super solvable arrangement. 
but the takeaway is that we have a nice common combinatorial understanding of of this here. And then the type BC arrangement that I had is also super solvable. Okay. So now I want to state our main theorem here. So we're starting with an arrangement in, in our vector space. And just for some notation, so I'm going to let T be the intersection of all of the hyperplanes. And I'm going to assume that I have some modular elements. So this is really so that I can look at some bundle. So what we're trying to compute is the topological complexity of this bundle of um, given some modular element for my arrangement A. And to make this an interesting bundle, I'm just going to assume that my modular element is not trivial, meaning it's not the vector space itself and it's not this this um, intersection of all hyperplanes, but it's some intersection in between. So my non-trivial hypothesis here is that this interval above y, so if I look at all of the, the subspaces can in elevate that are contained in y, I want to assume that this is super solvable. So what this, what this assumption is telling me is that this vibration, this particular vibration, can be written as a composition of vibrations, where I'm really just dropping one dimension in each step. Okay. So some more notation to, to discuss. So if I look at this interval, so this is, this is a partially ordered set. And I can write it as a product of, of some other partially ordered sets. And I want to do this as kind of as much as possible. Um, so I want to break it down to a, in a, to a product where each factor is, can no longer be written as a non-trivial product. So I'm looking for elements inside of this, inside of this post set so that here, uh, this isomorphism is given by kind of a map going this way, where if I take some collection of, of subspaces over here, I can intersect them and land in over here. So I want this kind of intersection map this way to give me an isomorphism of those sets. So I can always find some, some irreducible decomposition. It might be that this is already not possible, already irreducible, um, meaning P is equal to one. Um, so topologically what this means, so I'll say a little bit about this on the next slide, but topologically what this means is that the arrangement complement can be written as a fibered product of arrangement complements. So this kind of product in the post set combinatorially is giving me some sort of prod product topologically. Okay. So I'm really looking at in this arrangement when I want to write this as, as a product in, in some way. Okay, so given this, the topological complexity of this fiber bundle has this formula. So remember rank I said is the intersection of the hyperplanes in that set. So the rank of A here is really the co-dimension of this subspace. A sub Y is all of the hyperplanes containing Y. So this rank is really just the co-dimension of their intersection, which is Y. And this is P, so this is the really the maximum number of inter of factors that I can write um, this interval as a product. And then for each of these factors, I want to look at all of the hyperplanes that contain Xi but don't contain Y. Um, and then the co-dimension of their intersection gives me this. So a special case of this, if our dimension of y is equal to one, so if this vibration is just dropping one dimension, then, then this interval already is irreducible, so p is equal to one. Um, this interval is super solvable, so I don't really have to compare, care about that hypothesis. And then the rank of, of a and the rank of a sub y differ by, by one as well. So in that case, the, the topological complexity for this kind of more simple fiber bundle is just the rank of A minus AY. So that's how this formula simplifies here. Basically, this difference is one and this is one. So those all cancel out and leave me with just this. 
And really the idea for how to prove this is to do some sort of inductive argument on this. Um, so this is essentially the base case. You can kind of establish this first and then use it to get the more general formula. But to really show that this, this is equal to the topological complexity is we have to show two things, both that this gives an upper bound and that this gives a lower bound. So I wanna say a little bit about each of these, these cases, um, but first let me do an example of, of what this actually tells us for some examples that we talked about. All right, so the braid arrangement. So this is the, this fidel neuwirth bundle that, that we had mentioned before. So this was already computed to be 2n plus m minus 2, but our, our formula does in fact recover this. So our arrangement in this case, we're looking at all of these diagonals. If I intersect all of these diagonals, I end up with the points where all coordinates are equal to each other. So this is a dimension one subspace of an n plus m dimensional vector space. Uh, so that's what gives me this rank of n plus m minus one. And I said that this was my modular element giving me my bundle. These are all of the hyperplanes that contain it. And so the rank of this a sub y is the co-dimension of this, uh, which is an m minus one. And in this case, the this interval that I care about, so the subspaces that contain that are contained in Y, this turns out to be irreducible. I can't write it as a non-trivial product of, of intervals. Uh, so my P is just equal to one. And here, if I look at all of the hyperplanes that don't contain Y, in particular, this contains these diagonals where xi is equal to the x sub n plus m, the last coordinate. Uh, so if I intersect even just all of these, I end up with the same intersection as if I intersected all of the hyperplanes. So it turns out the rank of this set happens to be equal to the rank of this, this set, so n plus m minus one. And if we use these, so combining these into our formula, so we take this uh, minus this, minus this, and then plus this, and it simplifies to that, to that formula. And for the type BC arrangement, it has kind of a similar story in that the rank of my arrangement, so here the A here is supposed to be the BN plus M, so the arrangement and also the arrangement, the hyperplanes that don't contain Y, um, kind of for similar reasons have the same, the same rank. In this case, the rank is N plus M because if I intersect all of the coordinate hyperplanes, I end up with just the origin inside of my vector space. The rank of A sub Y, the co-dimension of this, I'm intersecting these coordinate hyperplanes, setting the first M coordinates equal to zero gives me something of co-dimension M. Um, so simplifying this gives me 2n plus m minus 1. Okay, so if this is for a, a bundle of these, these orbit configuration spaces. All right, so a few words on just how, how this proof goes. So I said that there's two things to do, which is to establish that our formula gives an upper bound and to establish that it gives a lower bound. In both cases, we're doing some kind of inductive argument. So here for the upper bound, we're doing induction on, on P. So this P was this, how many factors I can, I can write here. Um, and as I, I kind of said, this was, the product here is really telling me how to write this arrangement complement as a fibered product. Um, so I'm doing really a, an induction on the number of, of factors here. And there's a general upper bound for this parametrized topological complexity given by twice the dimension of fiber plus the dimension of the base. For the ordinary configuration spaces, this, this more or less is all you need. 
but in general, for these arrangement complements, this is this is too high. So we have to find kind of a better upper bound or a smaller upper bound for our things like our graphic arrangements. So the key for for making this work is to one of the first properties I gave of, of this parameterized topological complexity is whenever I have a pullback of bundles, the topological complexity of this will be bounded above by the topological complexity of this. So that's kind of what I wrote down here. So if I want to un, want to get an upper bound for the topological complexity of this, I can start with a, an upper bound for the topological complexity of this. And if I'm lucky, this, this um, this kind of general upper bound for this bundle oh, will be better than if I had used it for here. So we want to ask the question, if I have my bundle, can I pull it back from some other bundle? So we want to actually find this, this pullback diagram. And so the key is that, yes, if I do have a modular element, then what I can do is look specifically at this intersection. So this is where this A minus A sub Y is coming from. If I intersect all of the hyperplanes that don't contain Y, and look at the arrangement a mod a sub y, a mod y prime. Um, so this is some arrangement in the potentially smaller vector space. Then y plus y prime, because y is modular, this is actually an element of my intersection lattice. And it will end up being a modular element here so that this is also a bundle. So anytime I have a modular element, then this particular y prime gives me a bundle this way, um, so that this is actually a pullback of it. And the proof of this is mostly combinatorial, so I won't go into those those details. But the key is 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 recognizing this kind of topological notion of a fibered product. Sorry, right, whenever we have this pullback diagram, what this really is saying is that I can write m of a as a fibered product of these two things over this. So we're really asking the question, if I have M of A sitting over this, when, I, when can I actually realize this M of A as the fibered product? And so this kind of observed by, by Falk Proudfoot is this relationship between the modular joint of matroids and fibered products of these arrangement complements. Um, and so kind of the key to making this work is that whenever I have a modular element, I can actually realize it as a fibered product. Okay. And sometimes this, this doesn't give me anything interesting. So sometimes Y prime is the same as if I just intersected all of the hyperplanes. Um, kind of in this, these examples here, my Y prime intersecting all of these hyperplanes gives me the same as intersecting all of these. So for configuration spaces, for example, this doesn't give me anything interesting. It's really just pulling back my bundle through the identity map. Um, but for a lot of graphic arrangements, this is pulling it back from something where the base has some smaller dimensions. So it gives us kind of a tighter upper bound. So for lower bounds, again, we're doing some kind of an induction. So now an induction on, on really the, the dimension on, on Y. So for the upper bound, I should say, so here's recalling our theorem. Um, so we use this, this kind of idea of working with fiber products to give this as an upper bound. We didn't actually use this hypothesis of super solvable to get the upper bound. So more generally, the, the TC of this bundle will always be less than or equal to this formula. Um, but for the lower bound, we really need to use this super solvability. And the idea is that this interval being super solvable means that we can write this, this vibration as a composition of smaller fiber bundles, each looking like this. Um, and we're really kind of doing induction along those, those, those smaller fiber bundles. But in general, where, where you can get a lower bound um, for this, this parameterized topological complexity. Um, so if we have this fiber bundle from E to B, 
we have a diagonal map that includes E into this fiber product of E times Z over B. And you can look at the induced map on cohomology. And so the cup length of the kernel of that map gives us a lower bound. So in general, what we should be looking for is some long non-trivial product inside of this, this, this kernel. So here, to actually work with this, this kind of like in the upper bound case is, is mostly combinatorial. So there's a combinatorial presentation for the, the cohomology of our total space here, um, which for us is our arrangement complement. So this is, this is known as the orlog solomon algebra. So it, it's given by an exterior algebra where we have a generator for each of our hyperplanes and some relations depending on the, the dependencies among the hyperplanes. Um, so whenever we have a co-dimension of, uh, whenever we have an intersection of K hyperplanes that intersects in co-dimension less than K, so less than the number of hyperplanes, this gives us some dependency among those hyperplanes. Um, and so we get a relation for each of those. So this is very much a combinatorial presentation. And without too much work, we can get a combinatorial presentation for this ring as well. So for us, this is looking at the fibered product of M of A times M of A over this M of A mod Y. And so here we can take, again, the next year algebra where here we have really two generators for each hyperplane in, in A coming from one for each factor. But because this is a fibered product, if they both, if the hyperplane contains Y, so if it's really giving me a hyperplane in A mod Y, then those generators should be equal. And then I also get this, just like above the same orlick solomon relations um, for each factor. So I get it for the omegas and the omega primes. So this, this is a nice combinatorial presentation. And sitting inside here, so if we look at, um, so the map from this cohomology ring to this cohomology ring, um, it sends the omegas to the omegas, but also the omega prime H is sent to the omega H. So the kernel is precisely the ideal generated by the omega H minus omega prime Hs. So the kernel of this delta star is this. And so to, to show that our formula actually gives a, a lower bound, what we wanna do is find a product of things inside of this ideal um, that has the length that we, we claim. And this is quite a bit technical, but it is very combinatorial. And really the idea is that you can get a combinatorial basis for this, this algebra to actually show that some, some product is non-vanishing. Okay. I think that ended a little bit earlier, but maybe I should stop and ask if there are any questions. Any questions for Kristen? I have a question. Hi, Mark. Hi, Go. Hi there. Um, for your last uh, proposition on the last slide, you said it was a proof by induction, but I didn't quite follow. Uh, it seemed like a direct zero divisors cup length. Where's yes. the induction? So the idea is that, um, so our, our fiber bundle, um, M of A over M of A mod Y is a composition of fiber bundles. And so what we can do is if we have kind of a, a non-trivial product for one of the pieces of this composition, we can figure out how to make that product larger to get uh, something in this, in this ideal. So I'm not sure if that was right. So the idea, so maybe I should say, we're really looking at kind of some arrangement sitting in between them. So kind of by induction, I can find a non-vanishing product corresponding to the kernel of the delta star for this vibration. And then I can expand it to get a product in the kernel of the delta star for this kind of bigger vibration. Okay. okay thanks. I have another question as well, if I might. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so is it known when a, when a 
arrangement complement is aspherical, I suspect, sometimes. Uh, and then when is this quotient arrangement aspherical? Um, so there are a lot of examples of when it's aspherical, but I don't think there's an if and only if statement for when that is true. So I think the examples that I gave, so when it's super solvable, sorry, I guess I should say, when the arrangement itself, so when the intersection lies itself is super solvable, it is, it is a k pi one space. Okay. But I guess in our, in our case, so in our theorem, we don't really need the arrangement itself to be super solvable. What we really need is kind of some piece of it to be super solvable. So we're really like the fiber. I fiber is, is super, going the to fiber be. is aspherical in these examples. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the fiber will always be aspherical, but the the base space might not be. Okay. Okay. Thanks. I have a couple of questions too. Yep. Let's see. Um, I was wondering what happens if you replace the complex numbers by any other Euclidean space and how much of the techniques would be available? Yeah, so that's a good question. So the, let's see. Right, so this, they actually did determine this for any Euclidean space instead of C. Um, so it's, I believe it's the same whenever, I guess, what n is even? Maybe one of them. Right. All right. Sorry, whenever the dimension of the put in space is even. And then there's kind of a different formula whenever the dimension of that space is odd. So I haven't thought about, I mean, presumably that this this could generalize nicely. Instead of looking at hyperplane arrangements, you could look at subspace of arrangements, but I haven't thought about that yet. It's a good question. Okay. And, and I have another question. If you could go, if you go, if you could go back to your slide 12. Slide 12. Now you mentioned there that in this uh, upper estimate mm -hmm. uh, is a dimensional estimate it is usually much larger or it's larger than the, the actual estimate that you get by having this uh, pullback diagram. Mm -hmm. I wonder uh, if this difference can be arbitrarily large in specific examples. So how big that difference can be? Yeah, for instance, in, in, the, in the bread case, the difference mm -hmm. is only one. You have to go back, the, the, uh, you, you get a, a, an, I guess only one uh, improvement, an improvement of one dimension by splitting off something that comes from yeah. a circle or something like that. But in general, I wonder if the difference between the, uh, the dimensional upper bound and the pullback thing can be just much, much more larger, as, as, as large as you want, or is it bounded? So I'd say, I mean, so there is some sort of bound on it. Um, I guess the kind of opposite of that is if the arrangement itself were a product. So I guess maybe I would think kind of the other extreme would be like the Boolean arrangement. If you take all of the coordinate hyperplanes, this is a product. Um, I guess the, the, the TC of the bundle could be equal to the TC of the fiber. Yeah. If, if the bundle is trivial. Okay. Which, you know, you could make as, as far away from this twice the dimension plus the other dimension as you, as you like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Well, I might have just one comment. Uh, you mentioned the, as an example, the graphic arrangements. Uh, one natural generalization for that would be having a sort of um, complex, simplicial complex arrangements where instead of, uh, uh, depending on edges on a graph, well, you might not have a graph, but you may have something larger like a simplicial complex. And then controlling the collisions by the faces of this uh, of, of this complex, so that might be also 
particular case of, uh, of interest to take a look at. Yeah, good suggestion. Any further comments or questions? In that case, let's thank Kristen. And I will stop the recording and people can chat as they wish.